Here at the Command Valley Podcast, we were inspired to make EDH content that was a little bit more different and unique than you've usually seen. You're watching one of 12 Elder Dragon Highlander games consisting of four of the same players. However, there's a twist. The goal of the season is to attain as many points as you can. Points are awarded by wins, plays, and other interesting challenges. The player at the end of the season with the most points wins. Welcome to Duel of the Peaks. Hey, this is Griffin. And this is Caleb, and we're from the Command Valley Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to our first episode of our new gameplay series. We're going to go ahead and just explain it real quick, just just so you guys know what's going on. All right, yeah, we're going to talk about Duel of the Peaks. So let's talk about the challenges and the points. So each player is going to have certain challenges, personal challenges that they're needing to achieve, and there's also... Three table-wide challenges. Yeah, table-wide challenges that everybody can attain. So first off, we have the winning challenge. Now this challenge is gonna be across the whole series, meaning if at any time you win a game, you will get three points. Every of the other ones are gonna be individual to each of the gameplay videos. And if the person to your right wins, then you also get three points. This is to kind of throw off the dynamic of the game and make certain players want other players to win more than others or be fine with them winning. Throws a huge wrench into how you would normally play a commander game. Also, each player can choose to start the game with 25 life, and that's an automatic two points for the overall season. The way that we chose to start at 25 life was without anybody else knowing, and then we all revealed our decision at the same time. And then lastly, each player has a pet card, which means a card that they have chosen before the game began, before they drew, that if you are able to play, you get one point. And then each player also has their own personal challenge to to unlock so that they can get two additional points. And all of those personal challenges were tailored specifically to the decks. And without further ado, let's go ahead and go into our deck and player intros. First off, we have Landon, who is playing Ephara, God of the Poles. Key cards in this deck that you need to look out for are Blink-esque spells. He has a lot of things that are going to be blinking his creatures that have entered the battlefield effects, such as Soul Herder and Ghostly Flicker. His strategy will be to flash in, blink, or have creatures enter the battlefield on each upkeep so that he can draw cards off of Ephara's ability. Landon's challenge is to blink a creature six turns in a row. If he completes this challenge, he'll get two points. And his pet card is Azor, the Lawbringer. His opening hand consists of Azorius Chancery, Emergence Zone, Plains, Sahiri Refuge, Time Wipe, Soul Herder, and Knight of the White Orchid. All right, next up we've got my deck. I am piloting Marin in this video. The whole goal with Marin is to play creatures that bring value, let them die for more value, then bring them back for even more value. A lot of the cards that you can look for are cards that will be draining my opponents of their life to also keep me alive, such as Kokusho. And really the main strategy in the deck is to just recur, 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 get as much value from my creatures as I can. My personal challenge is to play my pet card three times so I can cast it and then I've got to recur it, basically just have it enter the battlefield three times. And that pet card is Plague Crafter. My starting hand consisted of Golgari Signet, Nim Deathmantle, Sidisi Undead Vizier, Elvish Rejuvenator, Kokusho, A Swamp, and Grim Backwoods. Next up we have my deck. I'm going to be piloting the Oketra God Eternal Mono White deck. The strategy of this deck is to be able to get Oketra out and play lots of creatures. Creatures that effects that can bounce other creatures to replay them multiple times to gain a large army of zombies. The cards that you should be looking out for are cards like Core Skyfisher, which allow me to bounce creatures when it comes into play, and things like Angelic Chorus, which can give me extra values off of the zombies that are entering the battlefield. My challenge in this game is to be able to hit each one of my opponents with two zombies over the course of the game. And my pet card will be White Mane Lion. My opening hand is Milliken, Oblation, Loyal Sentry, Ornithopter, Stone Cloaker, and Two Planes. All right, last but definitely not least is Peter, and he's piloting Brutoclad Telcor Engineer. The whole point of his deck is to get out tons of tokens and to change them with Brutoclad's ability to be the most effective token that he can get. That actually makes his 
personal challenge pretty difficult. He wants to have four tokens with different names on the field all at one time. His pet card is going to be Soul Ring. And his opening hand consists of Inkwell Leviathan, Talisman of Creativity, Buried Ruin, Mox Tantalite, Command Tower, Retrofitter Foundry, and Goblin Engineer. This gameplay video will be narrated by Caleb and I, so please sit back and enjoy the first gameplay of this new series, Duel of the Peaks. All right, I don't know about you, Griffin, but I'm excited for this match. As am I. This was a long-awaited match for the first episode of the season. Let's jump right into it. Yeah, in fact, I have been waiting to play my Marin deck against Peter for a long time and his Brutoclad deck because last time we played, he ran me over with 10 plus Grave Titans with his Mimic Vat. So this is, like you were saying, a long-awaited rematch. Let's get into it. A lot of animosity beginning. <laughs> Already, yep. Okay, so Peter gets to start off, and on his first turn, whoa, he, oh, he's already dropping a command tower. That's a pretty good first play. Let's see what else he's got. And he's going to suspend oh, Mox, Mox Tantalite. Yeah. With some pretty altar. Yeah. Oh, he's, he keeps going. And, and no, a Retrofitter Foundry. <laughs> yep, there's Retrofitter Foundry. Pretty good turn one. All right, and then we've got Landon. Let's see if he can do as well as Peter. We've got a uh, Sajeri Refuge, however you'd say that. Sajeri Refuge. One life. Note that everybody is starting at 25 life except for Landon. So we all chose to start at 25 life. We're going to start off with those two points at the very beginning, except for Landon. Okay. Yep, on my turn, all I played was a swamp and passed. All right. I drew. Play planes. I think that's all I did. Yep, looks like that is Griffin's turn. He passes to Peter. Peter untaps and draws. Mox Tantalite goes down by one. And there's a Reliquary Tower from Peter. He's going to tap two and play Goblin Engineer. This is a fantastic turn one and turn two. Searching for Mimic Vat, putting it into his graveyard. That is a brutal, brutal play. Yeah, I am not excited to see that card again. Playing Marin and focusing so much on my graveyard, that that's not going to be a fun card for me at all. I wonder who he searched that up for. All right, Landon draws and plays his Azorius Guildgate. Yep. And pass the turn. All right, and I'm up again. Okay, I'm going to play Tainted Wood and tap for two to play Golgari Signet and pass to Griffin. Nothing's better than a turn two Signet, that's for sure. Yeah. That was a pretty good play. And then Griffin's drawing and playing Milliken. <laughs> Nothing to say about the Milliken? <laughs> Nothing. No. All right, Peter Not untaps yet. and Mox Tantalite goes down by another one. Let's see if he's got a crazy turn three as well. If you're some... looking at it as far as this game goes right now, it seems like Peter's off to the best start. Yep, that's a Buried Ruin there. That's a great card. Hmm, maybe he's going to grab his Mimic Vat with it. Maybe, maybe not. I guess we'll have to see what he does here. Actually, this is a much better play. He's going to pay two, tap Retrofitter Foundry, and create a Servo. All right. wonder what he's going to do with that Servo. At this point, I actually reminded Peter not to sacrifice this on his turn, but he could do it at instant speed. The reason why is I had a Flash creature that could exile a card from a graveyard. But he made the right play here doing on his main face. Nice job, Peter. <laughs> oh, I'm not excited to see that Mimic Vat. Ah, Mimic Vat is out. Especially for your deck being a Golgari deck. That is probably the scariest card that you can see as a reanimator. <laughs> it's definitely one of the worst. All right, we're going to move to Landon's turn three. He draws. He's going to play his land. He plays an island. There it is, an island for turn. Let's see what he's going to play. Searching through his hand for something good. He could just pass at this point since he's playing blue, but let's go. Oh, Soul Ooh. Herder. Yeah, that is a really good card. That's going to do a lot of work. That is exactly that. what Lennon wants to see. This is how his deck gets going. Nice. All right, so he passes with the Soul Herder. I draw, play a Swamp. I'm doing all right on mana. That's good. At this point, I'm most likely going to cast a Marin. Usually when I hit four, yep, there goes Marin. That's what you want to do with Marin, right? You want to get her out early, start the engine going. 
try to get those experience counters as soon as you can. All right, Griffin Drew, and he's going, and he plays Martyred Rasalka. Rasalka? I've never seen that card before. Yeah, it's it's just a 1-1 one, one for one white that says, white, sack a creature, target creature can't attack this turn. Super cool art on it. It's um, got some way cool art. I love that. The reason why is one mana creatures in this deck are very efficient because the more creatures I can play, the more zombies I'm going to get. And if I can bounce those creatures and play again, that's all the better. Awesome. Yep. You definitely want those zombies. Okay. We're moving to Peter's turn four. He draws, gets his Mox Tantalite for free, sort of, after waiting a few turns. And he casts... Planeswalker, he casts Duretti. Oh, Duretti. This is bad Brutal. news for us. A Mimic Vat, Retrofit of Fanon, Goblin Engineer, and a Duretti on the battlefield. It's only turn four. Yep, and it looks like he's going to do a plus two on Duretti and discard two cards. He's going to discard Inkwell, Leviathan, and Echo Storm. Now, this is bad news for the rest of us. We obviously know he now has Goblin Engineer and Duretti. Two and he had yeah, two ways that. to recur Inkwell Leviathan. That means everybody who has an island, i.e. Landon, better watch out because that's <laughs> yeah. a 7-Eleven coming, coming at him. 7-Eleven with Trample, Island Walk, and Shroud. There, even for a blue player, there's not a whole lot that I think that Landon can do. All right, moving to his turn four. I'm guessing he's going to play a Farah. That's usually what he wants to do with his deck at this point. He actually plays a Soul Ring here. Let's see what he does after that. It's gotta be a far, I think you're right. Taps four, four a far. Very good. Yeah, this is this is definitely what he wants to do. He's got Soul Herder, which is gonna bounce his creatures, and a far, which is going to help him keep his mana up, but still get the effects off of a far because of Soul Herder, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, so here I go. I draw and I play a Phyrexian Tower and then Elvish Rejuvenator, which allows me to look at the top five cards of my deck and then grab a land and put it into play tapped. I'm gonna go ahead and grab a Llanowar Waste off the top. I love that little elf guy. And then I'm actually gonna sacrifice him to the Phyrexian Tower to add two black. And here comes Peter with his Mimic Vat. Peter is going to choose to exile the Elvish Rejuvenator under his Mimic Vat. I'm going to use the two black and tap my Golgari Signet to play Cultivate, search my deck for two forests, put one into play tapped, and then put one into my hand. This is all on main phase one. And then I'm going to go to combat. I wonder who I'm going to swing at. Maybe the guy that's not letting me get my Elvish Rejuvenator back. <laughs> the guy that also has a Planeswalker on the battlefield, too. Yeah. With that Inkwell it's Leviathan it's danger, sitting in the graveyard. Danger zone right here. All right. So I decide to swing Marin at Duretti, and Peter blocks it with Goblin Engineer. Interesting. Yep. And when it dies, he chooses to exile it under the Mimic Vat, and I get my Elvish Rejuvenator back into the graveyard right where I want it. All right, so I'm going to move to the end step and target the Elvish Rejuvenator in my graveyard. Griffin goes ahead and responds to the Marin trigger at the beginning of my end step with an Oblation, sending his Rasalka into his deck and then draws two cards. Marin goes ahead to return Elvish Rejuvenator to my hand. That was a long turn four, but we, we are now going to Griffin's turn four. Yeah, Oblation lets him go ahead and draw two cards. Not bad. I really needed to hit a land drop at this point. I didn't have enough lands, but I was able to draw two lands off of that, so it was worth the play. Oh, nice. Very nice. All right, so Griffin's turn four. He uses Milliken to mill the top card of his library to add a colorless to his mana pool, and then he pays five to cast Oketra. You're probably feeling pretty good about that. It's exactly where I want to be at. Okay, here goes Peter. with Talisman of Creativity. Nice job ramping over there, Peter. So he's gonna go ahead and pay two life and pour it into the Retrofitter Foundry to make another servo. Two mana, not sorry. two life. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> two mana, it's a little bit better. So with that two mana, he makes the servo and then minus two Duretti's to sack the servo and 
Just as we expected, he returns the Inkwell Leviathan, 7-Eleven Island Walking Trample with Shroud. Landon might be in trouble here. We'll see, we'll see. It seems like everybody at this point has gone off to a really good start. We've all got our commanders right where we want them. Yeah, this is looking good. So Landon's drawn and he started his turn here. He plays Emergence Zone. Emergence Zone, just to take a minute to, to look at Emergence Zone. One of the things that is underrated in Commander is lands that have an ability, because especially for me, I usually forget these lands even exist. Emergent Zone is one that allows you to tap and sacrifice it to cast spells with at flash. This gives you the ability to be able to interact with things you aren't normally able to interact with. And in Landon's deck, which is already an Azorius control deck, this is a pretty scary thing to see. Yeah, this is really good for enabling combos when he most needs it, so definitely not one of the lands that we want to see and he's really happy to have gotten that land this turn so landon's after playing the uh after playing the emergence zone landon is gonna go ahead and cast ghostly prison which makes it so that we have to pay two to attack him for each creature and then a knight of the white orchid which lets him grab a planes from his deck and put it into play as long as one of his opponents has more land than him and thanks to me ramping all game long or at least for the last two turns or so Landon gets to grab himself a planes and then he's gonna move to his end step here I think he's thinking about attacking but he decides to go to the end step and he blinks the knight with his soul herder he's not gonna get another planes because he's tied for the greatest amount of lands now but his soul herder is gonna get a plus one plus one counter and there goes the engine. This is gonna start to get pretty gross. All right, so I draw and cast an Elvish Rejuvenator. Hmm, didn't expect that. I love recasting that guy. And I get a swamp off the top, top of my deck. All right, so I'm gonna sack the Elvish Rejuvenator again, go to two experience counters for my Marin. And with the mana that I'm gaining from sacrificing the Elvish Rejuvenator, I'm going to cast Sidisi. So Sidisi does something really cool when she comes into the battlefield. She exploits a creature, or I have the option to exploit a creature, which means I sack it, and then Sidisi's ability goes off and allows me to search my deck for any card and put it into my hand. And of course, I'm pretty sure that I forgot, or maybe I just didn't care because I really needed something. I don't even remember what I searched for, but Peter goes ahead and steals my Sadisi with his dreaded Mimic Vat. Man, I hate that card, but that's definitely a good play for Peter. He's going to be able to search up whatever he wants. Definitely a greedy play, especially with the Mimic, mimic Vat out there. But this is exactly what Marin wants to do, getting something like Sadisi into your graveyard early, being able to recur it. That's the thing that can help finish the game pretty early. So honestly, this is going to be the thing that helps this game go on longer. Yep. One of the nice things here, though, was that with the exploit from Sidisi, I did go up to three experience counters, which let me bring Elvish Rejuvenator right back to the field. And I got to get a high market off the top of my deck for that. And then I passed to Griffin. But yeah, you're absolutely right. That that hurts big time. I, I want Sidisi in my graveyard, not in Peter's Mimic Vat. <laughs> but good for him. So Griffin draws, and it looks like he plays a Plains, and then casts Ornithopter, which is going to get him a 4-4 Zombie with Vigilance. That's pretty good for zero mana. It's exactly yeah. the best card in this deck. Anything zero mana, one mana. Yeah, those are going to get you lots of good zombies. And then he plays Banalish Marshall, which gives all of his creatures, all of his other creatures, plus one, plus one. That card is awesome in your deck. Yep, especially because it gives me another zombie with a catcher out on the battlefield. Yeah, there's a second zombie there. Nice. And he goes to swing. He goes to combat and swings Oketra at Doretti. Let's see what Peter's going to decide to do. I have seen Peter's deck go off very quickly. I'm very scared of the Doretti. Any way I can stop him from getting more value off of what he's already got. Yeah. So Peter decides to block with the Inkwell Leviathan. Not very surprising, but of course Griffin has got some tricks up his sleeve and he goes ahead and flashes Stone Cloaker into play, which is a 3-2 flyer. And that's going to return Oketra to his hand. And then he also gets to exile a card in a graveyard from the game. He's going to go ahead and exile what looks like Goblin Engineer. 
All right. And he passes to Peter. Peter untaps and draws. This is Peter's turn six. And yep, that's exactly what we thought he was going to do. He goes ahead and creates a copy of Sidisi using his Mimic Vat and exploits Sid the Sidisi token to search his deck for a card. Any idea what he's going to tutor up, Griffin? Oh, this is this is exactly what you want, especially with the pet card incentive, being able to tutor in your pet card. And there it is. There's a soul ring. That's the first point awarded to Peter for playing his pet card, soul Ooh. ring. Very nice, Peter. Way to abuse my stuff. <laughs> okay. So Peter is going to go into combat here, and he's remembering that his best target for attacking is... Landon, who's got a ghostly prison. So he's going to have to decide whether he wants to pay that extra two mana to attack or not. Let's see what he does here. I think he does decide to go ahead and attack and pay the two. And Landon's got a response for him. He's going to ghostly flicker. And he's going to target his knight and his gate. So he blinks the knight, blinks the gate, and he's going to get another planes. But then he has to take the 7 because there's not really anything that he can do against the 7-Eleven with Shroud and Island Walk. That is probably Landon's fear at this point is, is that 7-Eleven. Yeah. Luckily, he did start at 40 life and the rest of us are at the 20, at 25 life. Or at least we started at 25 life. So he's got a little bit more wiggle room than the rest of us. But that is not a race that he wants to be a part of at all. All right, so Landon goes to draw, and he casts Watcher for Tomorrow, and he gets to hide away something from the top of his graveyard, so basically it just top goes... Top of his library. Sorry. I, I'm the graveyard player over here. <laughs> he gets to do it from the top of his library. Thanks, Griffin. So he hide away a card under the Watcher for Tomorrow, and then when it leaves the battlefield, he gets to draw that card. Landon's going to go ahead and play Azorius Chancery, and then goes to his end step and uses the Soul Herder, to flicker the watcher for tomorrow and get that value train going he's yeah, gonna he, get the card off of the watcher for tomorrow and then do it all over again mm -hmm. he's gonna be able to do this every turn that is an extra card per turn that he's looking at the top three this is exactly what his afar deck wants to be doing this is a draw engine that that's just scary efficient yeah he got to look at the top six cards of his library not graveyard library and choose two cards. That's insane. Not to mention he's making his soul herder even bigger. I'm sorry. It's 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 eight cards with Watcher of Tomorrow, four for each hideaway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Okay, we're going to go to my turn six. And Landon's going to draw a card because of Afara. I go ahead and play a Grim Backwoods. I'm going to go directly into combat here. And it seems like Doretti's taken a lot of hate. I'm swinging Marin and the Elvish Rejuvenator at Doretti. Wow. Doretti is really taking a lot of heat. Yeah, this Doretti is just any planeswalker on the battlefield is a threat, and the, the sooner that we can get rid of it, the sooner that it's gonna leave. Yeah, I really want that thing to die, but it was kind of a dumb move because I'm casting my pet card, Plague Crafter. There's two points for me, which makes everyone sack a creature or a planeswalker, so Peter is undeniably going to just sack that Doretti that I just dealt four damage to instead of killing. So, no, I, I think that was the correct play because you so. were able to kill Doretti and then... Were you able to kill Doretti off of that? No, Doretti lived. He lived oh, with one see, loyalty. See, so it, it was a little bit of a misplay, but I, I go ahead and sacrifice my Plague Crafter and then Griffin decides to sack his Ornithopter and then Landon sacks the Watcher for Tomorrow, which gets him that card off the top of his deck that he already hit away. I don't think I was very happy with that... <laughs> that set of moves there. Anyway, I'm gonna move on and cast a Nim Death Mantle. Nim Death Mantle's awesome. It's one of my combo pieces in this deck. Nim, Nim Death Mantle lets me bring back a creature as it's dying, so it still dies, and I'm gonna get experience counters for it, just like I did off the Plague Crafter when I went to four. And then I can pay four to return whatever the creature is that's dying with the Nim Death Mantle attached to it. Nim Death Mantle goes infinite with anything that comes in with multiple tokens. So, in with a, the Ashnod's altar, with the Ashnod's well. altar or some way to be able to get that mana. So this is also a scary card to see. We're not seeing a Ashnod's altar quite yet, so it doesn't seem like a complete threat, but definitely something to watch out for. 
Yeah, and they, they know that I can search up Grave Titan and Ashnot's Altar pretty easily with this deck. So they should be afraid. Very afraid. Looks like I'm going to go ahead and sack the Elvish Rejuvenator again to the Phyrexian Tower and use that mana and the rest of my mana to cast Kokusho. Nobody's excited to see that card. That is one of the ways of dying from this recursion, especially with Kokusho draining people and giving you life. Yeah, it's five life per opponent. It gains your total of 15 life. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I went to begin my end step and I used Marin to target the Playcrafter when, and Peter responds to that by making a servo with the Retrofitter Foundry and then using land. that to save his inkwell leviathan yeah. very good play yeah i was i was trying to force the play obviously i would have rather he sacked the inkwell leviathan but he pulls the servo out and then landon actually also responds by sacrificing his emergence zone to cast seagate oracle which lets him look at the top two cards of his library put one into his hand and one on the bottom of his library and then he flashes in, since he can still flash more things in from the Emergence Zone, he, he plays a Wayfar Wayfarer's Bobble. So I go ahead and sack my Plague Crafter because I want to play it again for my personal goal. And then Griffin sacks his Milliken, Peter sacks that Servo that he made, and Landon sacks the Seagate Oracle. That was a pretty big turn for me. That was not too bad. All right, Griffin, you're up. You're drawing a card. And you cast Valoran Akros. Very underestimated card in this deck, especially with casting multiple creatures per turn. Here I am just trying to really power through Peter's board. Yeah, he definitely wants Peter dead. <laughs> so Griffin casts Loyal Sentry, which because of Valoran Akros is going to give his entire team an extra plus one, plus one until end of turn. And he goes to combat and swings all out at Peter. Peter's actually going to die here. This is 27 damage total. This is the power of these these, these zombies. I mean, you can really power out uh, with Valor of Akros, pumping up your whole team. And if you have just even a couple zombies, that adds up to a lot of damage, especially coming out of nowhere. With the incentive to go to 25 life to gain two points, this was definitely, definitely Peter's downfall. All right, so Peter's going to die. He decided not to block anything because he has nothing to block with and passes priority and I respond by sacrificing Kokusho to High Market. High Market gains me a life and then I drain everyone for five. So before Peter dies, I get to steal five life from him and gain a total of 15. I definitely get why you did this to be able to get the, the biggest advantage out of Kokusho that you could. Um, I assumed that you knew this was going to eventually happen. So holding that up was a wise choice. Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking to do. Man, but that was a crazy swing from you. Yeah, this is this is what I this is what I wanted. I'm my goal here is to be able to deal damage to each of my opponents. So I'm not trying to take everybody out at once, but Peter was definitely a threat. I knew that with Brutaclad out, he was gonna be able to make a ton of tokens that were gonna be copies of Sadisi, sacrifice all of those to be able to get more tutors. It was just going to be absolutely nuts and out of control. So I decided to make the choice to take out Peter first. All right, so Griffin ends his turn six with one dead opponent, and we go to Landon, who draws a card because of Afara, and then draws for turn. And he's going to play a land for turn, which is Port Town, and he reveals a Plains so that it comes into play untapped. And then he is casting something huge here. Oh man, that is not what you this, and I want to see. This is the worst thing, the worst thing that you could see off of a blink deck. Agent of Treachery is just absolutely gross. Did you see him just reach across the table and steal my Marin? Oh, this is not good. So he takes Marin. He obviously doesn't want Kokusho coming back over and over again. So this is a really good choice for him. And it pretty much shuts me down. And then he goes to the end, his turn's end step, in which he blinks the Agent of Treachery with the Soul Herder, giving the Soul Herder another plus one, plus one, and taking your loyal sentry. Wasn't very loyal in the end, was he? Not the, not, that's honestly not the worst that could have happened. I honestly didn't want him to take my zombies. This is the only thing I could use to be able to maybe get him to block with his Agent of Treachery. Definitely really hurt to see this. 
this this is the type of thing that makes you feel like the game is going to be over soon. Yeah, we're, we're definitely feeling it at this point, especially because he actually goes ahead and holds priority to cast Displace, allowing him to blink his Agent of Treachery for a third time, or getting it to come in for a third time, and he also blinks his Knight of the White Orchid. So he's going to go and get a Plains from his deck, and he's going to steal one of those zombies you didn't want him to steal. Oh boy. I, I'm probably getting salty right about now. This is, <laughs> I don't, I don't have very many creatures left, and you don't have any at all. So no, this I'm, is, I'm out. It's, it's me and you versus him at this point. Though remember that I'm actually okay with him winning, because if he wins, I get just as many points as he does oh, for yeah, winning the game. Oh yeah, that's right. You can tell it seems like it's two versus one here. Yeah, you're kind of in a bad <laughs> spot here. Though I'm actually pretty, I'm feeling pretty salty too, because he he took my girl. That's one of the hardest interactions to to deal with. If if somebody takes your commander and steals it without using an enchantment, that means you have to kill your commander somehow and play it back from your command zone. That that's not a good feeling at all. And with me with Oketra still in my hand, I I am just not feeling good. This is this is sinking. I don't feel like I'm going to be able to get very far. I really am hoping that at the top of my deck I'm going to pull a board wipe of some sort. Landon's feeling great, though. Oh, Landon's feeling fantastic. <laughs> this is this is yeah. everything he wanted. Yeah, the, Landon's doing a good job here. The, the thing that I'm really searching for is exactly what you said. I want some way to kill Marin because I'm at seven experience counters right now and could easily bring back Koku Kokusho. Um, after all of this, Landon gets to um, then draw three cards off of the Agent of Treachery and passes the turn to me. You're right, man. I don't have very much left here. I'm just going to go ahead and draw and then cast a Fauna Shaman, and I cannot wait for it to get stolen. I know that I was holding something back here, but I can't remember what it is, so I go ahead and pass to you. You untap here and draw. Uh, at this point, I really should have swung at, at Landon. I didn't have enough to pay for the, the ghostly prison, but... I'm going to go ahead and go to Caleb just because I'm trying to earn my two points. Maybe there's some way that I can board wipe later. Um, I assume it's going to be easier to get through Caleb now than later. Yeah, you might as well get those hits in so that you can put that towards your, your personal goal here. Absolutely. So all I'm hoping for is one more swing to be able to get through to Landon. Yeah, that's what I would have done too. I think that was the right play. So Landon draws and plays Sea of Clouds. He cracks his bauble to search for a planes. This looks like it's going to get crazy here. He casts a Reflector Mage, attempting to return my Fauna Shaman to my hand and keeping me from playing it on my next turn. He knows that there are tons of shenanigans that I can do with that Fauna Shaman, and I know it too, so I'm going to pay four, tap my Grim Backwoods, and sacrifice it to draw a card. And then hold priority and pay four for the Nim Death Mantle to reattach to the Fauna Shaman and keep it from completely dying. So because I sacrificed my Fauna Shaman, and even though it comes back with the Nim Death Mantle, the Reflector Mage trigger is going to fizzle. But at the end of his turn, as he goes to his end step, he's going to use Soul Herder to target his uh, Reflector Mage blinks his Reflector Mage and ends up targeting my Fauna Shaman again. Figured that he would, and that sends it back to my hand. I have no more tricks left. Yeah, without a without a sack outlet and some tokens, I mean, that Nith Death Mantle is a heavy cost to be able to bring things back. Yeah, it really was. So I go ahead and start my turn eight here, and I draw, and I cast a Wood Elves here. So I go ahead and cast that Wood Elves, and so I searched for a Dryad Arbor with the Wood Elves, and I actually went ahead and tapped it here for mana, and you, Griffin, you reminded me that it's got Summoning Sickness because it's a creature. I grabbed it because it was a creature, and I wanted to be able to sacrifice it with my lands, but you'll see us here rewind the play just a little bit. Yeah, every, everybody makes that mistake with, with Dryad Arbor, but... Yeah, especially with this one that uh, doesn't remind you that it's got summoning sickness and it looks <laughs> like just a super pretty forest. So anyway, we bring that back out and I tap the extra forest for so that I can do the right amount of mana to sacrifice it and then draw a card. I'm really hoping for something good here. Just trying to dig at this point. I mean, we're both in a very tight spot. Yeah, but I get exactly what I need. 
I cast play Damnation. Damnation. That's exactly what we want to see. <laughs> but as soon as Landon <laughs> goes to tap his land, we knew that this uh, this small hope is about to roll out the window. He casts Spell Swindle. Yeah, it's gone. Targeting it. I don't have a response. I'm playing Mono White Man. <laughs> and I'm pretty much tapped out, so I got nothing. So that that gets countered, and Landon gets four treasures off of that. That was not a good turn for me. I mean, it was a very good turn, apart from things being bounced and countered. And... <sighs> Bouncing and countering is is not good for us. So this this is not looking too hot. I go ahead and pass to you. I mean, it's just going further down the drain. Nothing, nothing is really bright about this situation. I'm really hoping for one of my board wipes. You know, we're we're casting a pretty negative light on this, but Landon's actually kicking our butts. He is just Dude, popping so off. He's doing absolutely incredible. Bouncing all of his his creatures to get his effect. He's got a Reflector Mage. He's got Agent of Treachery. Even if we get rid of the Deflector Mage or the Agent of Treachery, he has more stuff to play, and his Soul Herder is already amazingly huge. Me and Caleb are just looking at each other like, there's nothing we can do, so let's just go at each other and see what we can get. <laughs> yeah, so Griffin actually ends up swinging at me. He's feeling pretty sad here, and he figures that Landon and I are just going to end up with the points. So anyway, he swings at me with a zombie. I block with the wood elves. In response, I sack them to gain a life with the high market. And Griffin just... I don't think you cared here anymore. You went ahead and casted your Oketra. I knew it was gonna get stolen, but was hoping maybe he would look away for a second. Nah, he casts Ephemerate. <laughs> He's gonna steal that Oketra Straight away. You before he even Straight away. starts his next turn. Landon is crazy. So, so what he did was he casts Ephemerate, targeting his Agent of Treachery. Very treacherous agent, holy cow. He has stolen a ton <laughs> of stuff. So he steals it and then Ephemerate rebounds. So at the beginning of Landon's turn, he gets to blink it again and steals another one of your zombies. And at this point... I don't have anything left. Yeah. I don't have anything either. This this is the, the true power of uh, a blink deck. Whether it be Afaro, whether it be Brago, this is extremely powerful. Being able to do all these effects multiple times, having extra bounce spells in his deck. You can tell that Lennon put a lot of effort into this deck. He knew exactly what he wanted. He knew exactly what he needed. Amazing plays from Landon. Yeah, he's doing really great here. So he's going to play his land for turn. So he played his land for turn, and then he casts Eldrazi Displacer. And if, at this point, if we didn't think it was already game, we're now thinking it's definitely game. Eldrazi Displacer is so good. Landon's got the best of the best cards that you could possibly hope for in a blink deck. He casts Archaeomancer here to return Ghostly Flicker, and he then decides to go to combat, swings his Ephara and his huge Soul Herder here, as well as two zombies at Griffin. All right, so I block with the Sky Scanner and block with a zombie. Since mine is still a 5-5, I kill one of his zombies, but I do have to take 10. Okay, so after dealing a bunch of damage, Landon goes to his end step and uses my Marin to return his Watcher for tomorrow. So he sends that back to his hand and draws three cards from the Agent of Treachery. And then he goes to blink his Reflector Mage using his uh, Soul Herder, targeting Banalish Marshal to go ahead and steal that. Oh, he's actually bouncing it. He's using the Reflector oh. Mage. So yeah, he yeah, bounced the Reflector Mage. So Banish the Marshal is now back in my hand. I can't cast it next turn. Man, I can't keep his value engines straight here. <laughs> they, these turns are just absolutely incredible. Yeah, they're great. So I'm going to start my turn and cast Grave Pact and Fauna Shaman. Fauna Shaman can be cast now. And at the end of my turn, Landon blinks in an Avon Mind Sensor. He's adding salt to injury at this point. <laughs> well, actually, he's going for his personal goal. So he wanted to be able to draw a card at the beginning of your turn. And mm -hmm. I think it's because he knows he's closing this game out. So Griffin, you went ahead and drew and played Children of Corliss, which you can sack to gain life equal to the life you've lost this turn if you sack it. Now, I'm just trying to put anything out at this point. I don't think he's going to steal the the little one one but anything that i can put out maybe get some more attacks in anything helps yeah so you actually went ahead and swung at me with the four four zombie and the stone cloaker and i take seven then we go to landon's turn 
And he casts Ghostly Flicker, targeting that agent again, and his Archaeomancer. Which he uses to return Ghostly Flicker to his hand. There, There is, yeah, this is absolutely it for both of us. We're just waiting for Lennon to find a way to be able to finish this off. We're making jokes at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, Landon stole your Children of Corliss, and he casts Deputy of Detention and exiles your last zombie. And then he goes to Path of Exile, my Fauna Shaman, and I'm grasping at straws here. I've got nothing left, but I go ahead and sacrifice the Fauna Shaman to gain one life with High Market. And then target it with Death Mantle again. So Grave Pact actually forces both Landon and you to sack a creature. And Landon goes for that power play. Sacks, Gr sacks Marin. Oh, because he knows. He knows. He's got this in the bag. <laughs> I, I finally got Marin back, but... <laughs> I, I remember you saying, can you stop with the freaking power plays already? <laughs> Landon knows he's got this. This is just him stretching his muscles at this point. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he's pouring salt in the wound here. All right, we're just about at the end of this. This has been a crazy fun game. We, we've we Even though we've lost all of our stuff, we enjoyed watching Landon be able to go off and... and give us our commanders back here at the end well i think you he never gives for, mine back you never got a creature back but he gives <laughs> i was me begging mine. for him just give me some honor before i die <laughs> we'll give you your commander back just in time to kill you this turn <laughs> so he goes to combat landon's going to combat and swings with Ephara, even mind sensor and his knight at griffin who's got nothing left to block and a bunch at me and wins the game great job landon very good all right nice job that was a crazy intense game. Um, honestly, that that was absolutely a ton of fun. This is the first time that we've played with different challenges. Being able to play a little bit differently to try to earn those points definitely changed the game quite a bit. Yeah, I don't think that I would have been so nice to him the entire game. Yeah, and I don't think I would have attacked you <laughs> first, you know, trying to get those points. Mm -hmm. um, that, that Ghost of Flicker, though, was really halting me. So, Caleb, yeah. what do you think? What was the turning point? I gotta say, it was around turn six, it's I gotta think. It's gotta be that Agent of Treachery. It, it was that Agent of Treachery. Is that when he got it yeah, out? Yeah, just as soon as he dropped that Agent of Treachery, it just... I, I finished Peter off trying to get a player out of the game. I thought I was in a good position, but as soon as Lennon dropped that Agent of Treachery, blinked it multiple times, There, that it just... If you looked at a graph of how the game was going for me and you, it just dropped at that point. <laughs> yeah, it did. Oh, man. A huge swing at Peter. I, I didn't expect that. Peter obviously didn't expect that. I don't think any of us saw that coming. It was a great swing. Poor Peter. He he was he was doing some serious damage and holding mm -hmm. our big opponent back. We knew that, you know, Landon, if we let his deck go off, we were going to be in big trouble, so... Yeah, in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have killed Peter first. <laughs> He's probably the only thing that was helping us be able to take care of Landon. I was okay with it because I, I actually, thinking of the points again, I was totally fine with Landon winning, so... So let's go ahead and count the points up at uh, the end of the game. All right, so Landon finished uh, winning the game. He earned three points. However, he did not manage to get his personal challenge of blinking something six t or six turns in a row and drawing off of a Farah. So he is awarded for three points. He also did not play his pet card or start at 25 life. So Landon ends off with three. Next, we have Caleb. Caleb, you ended off with six, six points. Six points. I'm ahead, I think. Yeah, so you earned three points from Landon winning because he was on your right. You yep. played your pet card. And you started off at 25 life. Yeah, and I was just one more cast away or recursion away on my play crafter to get him in for a third time, which would have been my personal goal. But gotcha. So you're I'm close. So close. To, so close to A. Well, you ended yeah. off. Uh, you ended off strong. I'm happy with the six. Yep. For sure. Next, we have uh, Peter. Peter started off at 25, so that earned him two points. He also played his pet card, Soaring. That was another point. Um, he wasn't able to get the four different tokens, so. 
Peter finishes off with three points. Wonder why he wasn't able to get those tokens. Probably because you killed him. Shoot, maybe that was my fault. But <laughs> I came in last. I did not play my pet card or complete my challenge. I was close. I did start off with 25 life, so I ended off with two points. So, so far at the end of our gameplay, Caleb, you are ahead with six points. Oh, yeah, very nice. Followed by Lennon at three, Peter at three, and then me at two. All right, so this uh, it definitely was a fun game with those challenges. Now we see that it's not just about winning in these games. There's a little bit more to it. I hope you guys enjoyed how that felt, how that looked. So, Caleb, do you want to talk about our next one that we're planning? Yeah, it is super exciting. This whole month, we are focusing on Theros. All of our deck techs are from Theros, and our next gameplay video in this series is going to be all Theros commanders. So Super excited for that. That's going to be episode two. That's going to be releasing out the next month. Please tune in for that, guys. We're super excited to be able to share that episode with you. All of the decks are super fun. We won't tell you what it is. You'll have to tune in to find out. Expect some gods and maybe a really big scary titan or two. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe one. We'll You'll see. Have to see. Lots of damage. Lots of card draw. You guys will. You guys will love it. Yeah, don't, don't forget to subscribe and like and definitely hit that bell so that you can be notified of all of our upcoming videos. We're really excited to continue with this series. There are going to be 12 episodes in all and we release deck techs every single week. We'll also be focusing a lot on combos. So we're going to have a lot of short videos about how combos work and how you can stop them, how you can play with them, etc. So stay tuned and we'll catch you next time. Thanks guys, see ya.